Hello, Jeff. I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore, peace host and producer of Omni U Presents, the H3O Art of Life show. I'm here at Afriware Bookstore in Oak Park, where my dear friend Nzinga is a proprietor, and we are going to have an interview with Tony Browder. And there's a little I can tell you about Tony Browder, but most of what you're going to learn about Tony Browder, he's going to represent himself. But Tony is, among other things, a lecturer, teacher, professor, archaeologist, artist, architect, and some other things I've learned over the years that I've been watching him and reading his work. And he is here today to talk about the subject that I'm just introducing, and that is know thy history, know thyself. And I know that you are very, very prepared to discuss that topic because the last time, well not the last time, but the time before last that I saw you, you were at the ASCAC conference in 2009, mm -hmm. and um, that was pretty much your theme. You didn't call it that. I think uh, you called it the... Uh, the rebirth of Nile Valley civilization. That's right, that's mm -hmm. exactly right. So I want to, I want to just frame it this way. There were a, a number of things that you redefined and I think it's very important that we address that because you were saying that when you change the name of things, you change the spirit of those things. And when the names are lost, we can't find our way home. So we can't know ourselves if we don't know our name. And three of the things that you discussed were things that Asa Hilliard had presented in his last lecture. So would you like to open with that? Would you like to tell us something about the names that have been changed that we need to know the difference between the names that we ought to be using and what they really mean. Sure. Uh, well, one of the things that Dr. Dr. Hillier talked about at his last lecture in 2007 in Aswan, Egypt, for the ASCAC conference, uh, he began talking about um, the pyramid. And he said that you know, pyramid is not an African word. It's a Greek word. Uh, the word pyramid means little flat cake. And that the original name for that structure is mir. The word mir in the ancient Kemetic language means the place of ascension. Mir were built, mir, that conical shaped structure, were built over tombs. And no bodies were actually buried inside of mir or pyramids. They were always buried beneath. And when you understand the significance of that word, mir means the place of ascension, was built underneath the tomb. So it was the vehicle through which the soul of the deceased ascended into heaven. So one of the terms that is now being used to describe uh, that structure is uh, a resurrection machine, which is a more apt description of, uh, of that structure. Uh, another word that is, uh, that we know better by its Greek name than its African name is the word um, sphinx. Sphinx is a Greek word which means to strangle or to hold. And it comes from the story, uh, like for example, the story of Oedipus Rex. Uh, the monster that terrorized uh, the Greek population in ancient Thebes in Greece, not Thebes in Egypt. Uh, and, and so that monster would, would pose a question to the people who walked down that road, and that question became known as the riddle, riddle of the Sphinx, who would walk so on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, three legs in the evening, and the more legs that it walks on, the weaker it becomes. The, and whoever could not answer that question was strangled by the Sphinx. Um, and so the original name for that structure is Her M. Aket, Heru on the Horizon. Heru was the son of a Sarna set, the founding mother and father of ancient Kemet. Kemet is the original name for the country that the Greeks renamed Egypt. Uh, Egypt is derived from uh, the Greek uh, mispronunciation of Hakapata, or the Temple of Apata in the city of Menefer, which the Greeks renamed Memphis. So Hakapata became Agapta, which became Ajaptus, or Egypt. So the, the issue here is, uh, if you don't know the original names that your ancestors named a person or a place or an object, then you'll never be able to understand the spirit that is embodied in that thing, in that place, in that person. And I, I like to make the analogy of, um, of roots. Everybody has seen, hopefully everybody has seen, uh, the series, if not uh, having read the book. And one of the most uh, telling scenes uh, in that television program that stands out in my mind was when uh, Kunta Kente's uh, 
owner literally beat the African out of him. After he purchased him, uh, he beat him and, and, and until he embraced his new name, Toby. Toby. So he was no longer Kunta Kinte, he became Toby. And I submit to you that if Kunta Kinte's mother was kidnapped a month after he was stolen, and sold and lived in a concentration camp a half a mile away from where Kunta Kinte was. And she asked the people there, have you seen my boy? Have you seen Kunta Kinte? Nobody would know who he was because his name had been changed. So for us as African people to begin the process of knowing ourselves, we have to know what we call ourselves. We have to know where where we came from. We have to understand the, the energy, the spiritual energy that comes with calling something a specific name. And that's the first step, one of the first steps to uh, reclaiming your, your mind, uh, your consciousness, and your soul. One of the things you talk about is how you, you, you say that if we know our history, we could not have gone from being gods to dogs. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that, that our enslavers had to do in order to ensure that we would be controlled by them is to erase our memory. And I, I use the metaphor that, that the past, our past has been erased I mean, and the erasure has been lost. forgotten. Mm -hmm. So we don't know and we don't know that we don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and with the absence of that knowledge, with the absence of the knowledge of the absence of knowledge, we now will become whoever they say we are. So it, it, it's important for us to begin to realize one basic reality, we, we only know what we know. So we have to ask the question, who's responsible for telling you what you know, for teaching you what you know? Has it been the descendants of your enemies? Or has it been someone, someone within your family? And, and the reason why we have, have to ask the question is, oftentimes we are miseducated by people who look just like us, by people who love us, by people who are in our families. Which, which essentially reinforces the fact that you only know what you know. I, I learned about the Christian God through my grandmother, who was, was probably closer to the Creator than any European who, who ever introduced her to God, uh, but because this was what she knew. And she learned about God through her mother. So all they can do is pass down what they know. And it was, it was essential this knowledge or embracing this information was necessary for my grandmother to negotiate life here in Chicago after they moved up here from Alabama. And she took me to church. She was my first exposure to, to Christianity. But fortunately, I was born with a inquisitive mind, and I would ask questions. You know, well, why is it that all the people in the Bible are white? Why is it I don't see people like me in the Bible? Why is it that if, if the, the church is the house of God, why is it that, you know, people, somebody stole my mother's purse in the church? If God's supposed to be, you know, I'm asking questions that you're not supposed to ask. And, and, and the only response is, oh, don't ask those questions. And that's. You don't question God, you don't, is what they told yeah, us. Yeah, well, but that's what, that's what they told us. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just fortunately never, never accepted that. Uh, you know, that's one of the benefits of having an inquisitive mind and a, and a supportive family that encouraged uh, asking questions. You talk also about when you don't know yourself, you don't know what you have, the, you haven't begun the work that you came here to do. Mm -hmm. So how did you learn the work that you came here to do? How did you, you, you said that your original interest was in architecture. Right. And then you changed it because someone failed to teach you math. Right. So You remembered all of that, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. So talk about how you were able to find yourself, even though you really didn't have a real great handle on yourself at that time. Well, uh, early on anyway. And to, to just add to that story, I developed the phobia of math in the fourth grade. That's when we were learning the multiplication tables. And my fourth grade teacher was my first African-American male teacher. And he had this, this terrible habit of, of uh, hitting you with the ruler if you missed a question. He would ask questions. And, and I remember him, he asked me my multiplication tables. I got it wrong. He hit me with the ruler. And that just caused me to have a mental lockdown. 
uh, with regards to math. And uh, when I came to high school in Oak Park, I uh, developed a love and appreciation for architecture. In my last two years, I took architectural classes. My freshman year at, at Circle, I majored in architecture, but I never could get over this phobia of math. And I just reached the point in, in my freshman year in, in college where I was just tired of Chicago. I, I wanted to get away. And I went to Howard uh, the summer of 71 uh, to, uh, to try out summer school at Howard. And I liked it. I liked the environment. And I transferred to Howard and changed my major from architecture to design. I, I've been drawing all of my life. And so it wasn't uh, a stretch for me to just shift gears and, and, and do design, graphic design and advertising instead of, uh, instead of architecture. And moving to Washington, D.C. was probably one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. Uh, it probably saved my life because so many of my friends that I grew up with uh, here on the west side of Chicago uh, many of them are dead, uh, and those that are alive are barely living. Uh, they're 59, 60 years old, still living at home with their mothers. They're recovering alcoholics or recovering drug addicts. And uh, I, I realized shortly after moving to Chicago when I would get regular phone calls from my friends back home about uh, friends who had died, friends who were shot by the police trying to rob somebody, friends who had OD'd on heroin, another friend who died of uh, alcohol poisoning. And, and I'm, I'm in Washington, D.C., and all of my friends are dying. And I ask the question, why, why am I still alive? And, 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 and a voice that I've learned to, to, to listen to said, well, Tony, not everybody's going to make it. And I realized that my leaving Chicago was uh, insurance that I was going to make it. I was introduced to, to new concepts and, and new ideas, new people from all over the world. Uh, Washington is a very metropolitan city, and I had the opportunity to get exposure that I probably would not have gotten uh, had I stayed in Chicago. And that then opened the door for me to begin to, to meet people who put me on the path that I'm on now. And of course, Asa Hillier. Oh, I met, I met, Ace, I met Ace in Chicago. Oh, really? <laughs> I met Ace in Chicago in, um, uh, I guess that was 1980, I believe. I had, um, I had gone to, I had read this book, um, this, this friend of mine in Washington, uh, who was part of my first study group, um, had this magazine called Uraeus, the Journal of Unconscious Light. And it was published by an organization in Los Angeles called the Aquarian Spiritual Center. And it was part, they had uh, a series in there, a four-part series called The Black Dot, written by this guy by the name of Dr. Richard King. Oh, yes. And I read that series and was so fascinated by, by these ideas about ancient Egypt and, and the psychology of the soul and, and, and the culture and the symbolism that uh, I decided to fly to uh, L.A. And, and meet the, the owner of the Aquarian Spiritual Center, a brother really? by the name of Dr. Alfred Lagarde. Okay. And I sat down with him, went to his bookstore. He, he owned one of the oldest continuously existing black bookstores in the country. And uh, I sat down with Dr. Lagarde for about three or four hours and just had a, a profound conversation and um, became, I joined the Aquarian Spiritual Center. Uh, a metaphysical organization that was geared toward African Americans. Uh, they had a, a, a Richard King was Dr. Lagan's prize uh, student. Uh, if I can make a, a comparable uh, comparison, uh, if Dr. Lagan was Elijah Muhammad, then Richard King was Malcolm X. Okay. Uh, it was that kind of relationship. Okay. And they held a conference in Chicago. And I decided to come to Chicago to attend the conference. And the keynote speaker at the conference was Asa Hilliard. So after having met Asa, you know, I realized that, that these are, are men who have a level of awareness that is, is what I wanted. And I began reading what they read and, and, and following them. And that was another, um, uh, I guess, road, uh, stone in the road that I followed over the past 30 some odd years.
I want to talk, I want you to talk now more about Kemet. I want you to talk first, one of the first that uh, intrigues me is the, the, uh, the spiritual and theological or religious systems. They were the first to, well, they, they were the first to have a nation. They were mm -hmm. the first nation with the first flag, which I found was extremely interesting that it was red, white, and blue. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But the, the, I just always held that African people could not have existed on this planet for all these years without any spiritual ideas. And so the whole idea that we should have to get our notions about spirituality, about who we are, about our relationship to the divine from people who didn't, didn't even have a name for their spiritual uh, deities, you know, that God, you know, that's a noun, it's a, it's a group, mm -hmm. it's a class, mm -hmm. and you know, they did, certainly they weren't acquainted with their gods because they couldn't give their gods a name, mm -hmm. give their gods names. But the, the, I, it intrigues me that among other things that Africans have given us so many of the first things the, f the first civilization, the mm -hmm. first nation, the first flag. So talk about some of those first at whatever length you'd like. Well, as Hunter Adams reminds us, God is a German word. So what we ha be have to begin to do is to look at our concept of the creator through our own cultural lens. Uh, Kemet, or ancient Egypt, is the oldest documented civilization. It's much older than Mesopotamia. Um, uh, well, let me back up for a second. Uh, the very first Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, human beings, were born in Africa. Uh, and therefore, it makes sense then, since Africans have lived on the planet uh, much longer than anybody else, and that uh, geneticists, through tracing the mitochondria DNA, have identified uh, the common denominator, common denominator that links all human beings, all human beings, regardless as to their race, have within them the mitochondrial DNA, which links them to a group of women who are still living in Africa today. They did the uh, paternal DNA testing and found that all males living on the planet, regardless of their uh, race, uh, have a paternal DNA that links them to a group of men who are still living in Africa today. So that should, on a genetic level, uh, settle the question as to who was Adam and Eve. If you want to use that Christian uh, reference, the first male and female on the planet lived in Africa, hence they were Africans. Uh, and Africans lived on the planet uh, for hundreds of thousands of years before other human beings speciated from those Africans after they walked out of Africa into Asia and then across the land bridge, uh, the Bering Strait into the Americas and down into North America and South America and then populated all of the islands uh, within, within the Pacific. Uh, so every human being is, is a descendant from Africans. Uh, the people classified as Caucasians uh, did not come into existence uh, un until about uh, 40,000 years ago. So they are latecomers to humanity. And, and this is something that, that, is, that is known by geneticists. This is known by paleontologists. They may not talk about it publicly, but they know this to be a fact. So, since the first human beings lived in Africa, it makes sense then that we would find evidence of the first civilization. And we found that evidence uh, in, in Kemet. So what we know is that according to the story of ancient Kemet, uh, that civilization was founded by a man by the name of Asar. Uh, the stories of most people, regardless as to where they may have lived, is, is usually shrouded in myths. And, and myths, uh, are not necessarily falsehoods in and of themselves. They're a way of explaining the unexplainable in such a manner that the, anybody can understand it. Myths are larger than life stories that everybody can relate to in some aspects. So Asar is said to have been the founding father of ancient Kemet. He is said to have unified the two lands of Upper and Lower Kemet. He is said to have established the first nation state. He is said to have introduced agriculture, Medu Neter, writing. He is said to have introduced spirituality, acknowledgement of a creator, an unseen force which is responsible for creating and sustaining everything that is. 
And after he established his nation, Kemet, which means the nation of the blacks, not the black soil, but the nations of the black people, because black was a color that was associated with the creator. And he then left Kemet to travel to other parts of the continent of Africa to share his knowledge and technology with his brothers and sisters um, on the continent. And in his absence, Asar left his wife, his, his wife Aset, to run their nation. And then according to the story, uh, this act angered Asar's brother Set, who felt he should have been left in charge. Aset ultimately uh, murdered his brother, uh, usurped the throne. Aset fled for her life. And uh, in her absence, um, uh, in her absence, uh, uh, again, the story is, is, is kind of convoluted, but uh, Set murdered Asar and then ultimately cut his body into 14 pieces, scattered them throughout the land. Uh, and that story of Asar's body being cut in 14 pieces is the Greek version of the story because uh, there are different versions of the story. In some versions, his body was cut into 28 pieces. Uh, but, but the essence is that Asar's body was cut into multiple pieces, scattered throughout the land. A set went searching for the missing parts of Asar's body. She found all of them except one. And as she found each body part, she, she cleaned that body part, she anointed it with oils, and then she laid out all of the pieces of Asar's body on a table and literally remembered her husband, wrapped his entire body in bandages, and created the first mummy in recorded history. And then she prepared her husband for burial. It took her 70 days uh, to complete this process. And so 70 days for the next 3,000 years at the minimum became the time frame for the process of mummification for everybody who died in Kemet. That's how important this myth was, this story was to the people of this land. So before Aset buried her husband, uh, she grieved as any widow would grieve. She was about to bury the man that she loved. Uh, she grieved because she was still a virgin. They had never consummated the marriage. She grieved because she would never bear children or have an heir to her husband's throne. So before Aset buried her husband, a miracle occurred in Kemet, in Africa. You know, we're not used to even conceiving the possibility of miracles occurring uh, in Africa, but a miracle occurred, and that miracle was the spirit of Asar came and visited his wife and impregnated his virgin wife, Aset. And then nine months later, the virgin Aset gave birth to their son, Heru, who was born to avenge the murder of his father and reclaim his father's throne. Now, this story sounds very familiar because other people have borrowed the story. Mm -hmm. They changed the names in order to protect the guilty and presented it to others as their own creation. But the beautiful thing about knowing yourself and, and knowing where your origins lie is that you can go to Egypt today and visit temples, some of the earliest temples ever built by humans on this planet, and see this story carved on stone, carved in stone within the temple, a story that a temple that was built at least, at least 1,200 years before the birth of Jesus the Christ. So once you begin to know where to look, you will find all of the evidence that will tell you who you are. And knowing who you are then also gives you the ability to begin to identify who these others are not. So since we are controlled by fear, we're controlled by ignorance, then those who are in, in power understand very clearly that the only way they can maintain control is by keeping people ignorant and fearful. And they, uh, their warped sense of, of, of justice, uh, feel compelled to do everything within their power to keep African people powerless. And that's the game that's been played for at least the last 500 years. That is just such an amazing story for you to have all of that. You're used to digging, you've been digging not only archaeologically, but you've been digging through the records so that you will know our history, so that you will be able to bring us this. And we are very grateful to you for the work that you've done. I want to mention some of the work that you've done before I get away from it. This is 
something that you say is ages old, but this is how I came to know you okay. from the Browder file. I think everybody uh, who knows Tony Browder knows this work, knows about this work. I have a question for you from, from this that one of our guests in the audience has, has asked me to ask you. Avatar was not familiar with, so you might want to tell us something about this. I just, at this moment, I just want to, to mm -hmm. introduce this work. And this is Finding Karakunum. Karakamoon. Karakamoon. I told Hunter I was not going to be able to pronounce this. <laughs> And, and see, whatever you say becomes your reality. Right. So if you say you're not going to be able to pronounce it, you <laughs> won't be able to pronounce exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> but I won't say it again because I've done it. Okay, and Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. One of the things that you said was that uh, we produced, uh, that Kemet produced the first uh, civil servants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Talk about that a bit before we get into what's in these books. Right. I, I, as I, as I often remind people, I'm not trained as an artist. I mean, I'm not trained as an author, even though I've authored uh, six books and co-authored six books. Uh, I'm not trained as a historian. I'm not trained as a researcher. These are things that I grew to love to do. So I write like an artist. And um, what, I, what I do is I, I, I bring an artist's perspective to my analysis and interpretation of history, so I view history through through the eyes of an artist. And what was your question? I forgot your question. Forgive me. I was asking you about the civil uh, service, the first civil, civil service. Servants okay. That uh, that okay. Kemet produced. So so, even though I'm trained as an artist, an artist with a profound love for architecture and city planning, you know, I I, I love that stuff. I love the idea of, of making buildings or or creating spaces where people will walk in and out of. Uh, creating cities where people will move around. I, I love just thinking about everything that goes into creating that. And so if you think in terms of Asar created uh, the first nation state, so he is the administrator of that nation state, but he can't do everything by himself. He needs architects. He needs engineers. He needs physicians. He needs people who know how to uh, manipulate the Nile River. You, you realize that that uh, the ancient Kemites uh, were able to change the course of the Nile River. They were able to uh, build canals from the Nile into, into the desert in order to uh, bring soil and, and, and life Irrigate. to different parts of, of, uh, of the desert. Uh, they had skills that we don't normally associate with ancient people. Uh, just think in terms of architecture. The Step Pyramid is, is the first building ever constructed by human beings on this planet. It is not just a building, it is a temple complex. Uh, it's a temple complex with the first columns ever designed by human beings. Now, they're not, uh, they're, they're attached columns, they're attached to the wall, not the freestanding columns that they would later build at, at Ipet Asut, uh, or Karnak Temple, but they're the first columns ever, ever designed. And, and, and all of these temples that they created were, in essence, a replica of their environment. These columns represented the palm trees, um, or, or, or um, uh, they had elements from, from nature that were incorporated within their city design. So uh, what we see here are, uh, is, is the creation of systems of administration. You had to have, you had to have architects to design the buildings, to design the cities that were going to surround the building, to design the temples. And there's a, a basic structure that is part of that design. And then they replicated it all over the city. You have to have physicians because um, as people construct the building, they're going to they're gonna hurt themselves. You know, so, so they're doctors. They knew how to set bones. Uh, as Richard King said in, in um, uh, one of his Urea series, that they had, uh, they had eye doctors. They had performed brain surgery. You know, the oldest recorded example of brain surgery took place in Kemet uh, at, at least 500 years before Hippocrates, the so-called um, uh, uh, first Father physician, Medicine. Father, Father Medicine, Medicine existed. So, uh, you know, you, you, you had psychologists, you had teachers, you had librarians. Each temple was uh, administered by priests who were scholars. Each temple had a library. Each library had thousands of books on every subject matter uh, imaginable. 
So the books were made out of papyrus scrolls. Somebody had to come up with the idea of creating papyrus, taking the papyrus plant and cutting it into slithers, uh, laying the slithers down in a, in a uh, crisscross pattern and then pressing them together so that it makes paper. Somebody had to create the ink to know uh, what, what minerals to use in order to make the red ink, what minerals to use in order to make the, um, the black ink. Uh, artists had to determine what was going to go on the walls of the temples. And the Egyptians were the first artisans that we know of to create a grid pattern to, to create uh, uh, drawings or carvings or statues that were two, three, four, five stories tall. These were all skills that had to be developed by legions of men and women. So these were the first civil servants, and these first civil servants went on to become the first middle class in history. And all of this occurred in Africa thousands of years before there was civilization in Greece or Rome. All of that's documented. So in, in, light of, in light of that reality, what Europeans had to do uh, in falsifying the history or erasing our memory, they had to claim all of that as their own. So it was, it was James Henry Breasted, uh, well, Breasted in 1936, uh, he revised his book Ancient Times. Uh, in the first version of Ancient Times, which he published in 1916, he described the ancient Egyptians as dark-skinned people who are not unlike the Nubians who inhabit that area. Uh, and then uh, it was Nelson Rockefeller uh, who created the University of Chicago. Nelson Rockefeller was so uh, enamored by James Henry Brester's book, Ancient Times, he, he would read that book. To, and it's a, it's a wonderful book. He would read that book to his children every night. And so he decided to give uh, Brester $1.5 million to establish the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. But obviously, he had strings attached to his money because in the revised version of Ancient Times, James Brester removed all references to the Egyptians as being dark-skinned people. And he stated specifically that Egyptians belong to the quarter of the world where the great white race lived and developed culture and civilization. So they, he moved Egypt out of Africa. Uh, and, and, and more than likely, he was, um, he was encouraged to do so in order to, to get the money that uh, Rockefeller made available to him. Talk about your experience going to the Oriental Institute. Were you? <laughs> <laughs> See, okay, you remember a whole lot. Um, <laughs> what I do at the Oriental Institute is, is what I do wherever I go. Uh, because of my love of art, my love of design, my love of architecture, Whenever I, whenever I see a building, I, I look at every aspect of the building. I try to get into the head of the architect or designer of that building. Why did they place the windows here? Why that stone? Uh, what, what's, what, um, uh, what, what carvings are on the outside? And, and um, those who know me know that you know, buildings talk to me. I you know, know you yeah, said building, that. Yeah, buildings <laughs> talk to me. You know. uh, and and I first, that first happened to me when I was uh, studying the Library of Congress. Uh, in a book that you don't have there, a book entitled Egypt on the Potomac. Mm -hmm. uh, Egypt on the Potomac is a book I wrote in 2005, but it describes a activity that I created in 1986 after I returned from my second trip to Egypt in 1985, where I began <laughs> to realize upon coming back to Washington, D.C., Egypt was still fresh in my mind, and as I drove or walk throughout D.C., I kept having flashbacks of Egypt. I kept seeing things in Washington that reminded me of things that I had just seen in Egypt. And understanding what I understood about city planning and, and design, I knew that that wasn't an accident. I knew somebody studied ancient Kemet and made a decision to replicate it here uh, on the banks of the Potomac River. So I began uh, researching the history of the layout, design, and development of Washington, Washington D.C., and this field trip uh, which initially was called uh, an Afrocentric tour of D.C. I now refer to it as Egypt, Egypt or the Potomac grew out of that experience. And the whole uh, uh, capstone of that experience uh, is, takes place at the Library of Congress. But if you, if you tell them that, I won't get to ask you that question. You've got to tell them about the Oriental Institute. Oh, and okay, then you okay, tell, okay. And then get them, back to that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, uh, you know, I... I, I, I I learned to listen to my inner voice. So when something says, Tony, look at this, I turn and look. 
and I kind of break down the symbolism of the architecture. So I've been doing that for a long time. In 2009, when I was here for the ASCAC conference, I went over to the Oriental Institute to just take a look at the exhibit. And walking inside, uh, before I walked inside, um, uh, above the entrance to the building is this design that is, uh, uh, basically it depicts the uh, knowledge of ancient Egypt being introduced to the Western world and Europeans are borrowing that knowledge and use it to creating their culture and civilization. And all of that is um, embodied or encoded in uh, the, the frieze that's above the entrance to the Oriental Institute. So you know, I, I spent about half an hour looking at it, identifying all the figures and uh, the, the chronology that was listed. So I went inside the Oriental Institute and asked people there, if somebody there could, could tell me, you know, who designed this. And uh, so I know this is the Oriental Institute. This is the University of Chicago. You have this information somewhere. So I asked, you know, who knows this information? And nobody knew nothing. Nobody knew nothing. Nobody was willing, at least willing to, to tell me anything. And then there was a sister uh, working at the, the uh, cash register in the bookstore. So she said, well, I think there's a magazine upstairs that has that information. I'll see if I, go get, if I can go get it for you. So I'm looking around, and I came back, and she had the magazine. And sure enough, uh, that particular issue of uh, the magazine published by the Oriental Institute um, focused on the architecture and design of the Oriental Institute. So everything that I was asking for was in that publication. Everything, a breakdown of all the figures, who they were and what they represented. And, and, and I was 100% on the money. But again, nobody who worked there knew anything at all about that. And, and, and I'm not surprised because people don't pay attention to environments. You know, people have work on their mind, have other issues on their mind, and they're not thinking about where they're moving, uh, the spaces that they're moving into and out of. Uh, and, and so that's a, that's a talent, that's an ability that, that I've cultivated over the years, and it, it, it serves me it serves me very well. So much so that uh, Brother James Small in New York called me up and said, Tony, there, there's a building down here uh, on Wall Street that has some stuff, some images in front of it. Um, uh, you need to come down here and take a look at that. So I went up to New York one weekend and uh, met him, and he took me when took me down to the building, and um, I'm looking at the building, and I said, my God, I mean, it's, it's plain as day. White folk telling you very clearly, and what's the, what's the name of the building? It's the U.S. Customs House, U.S. Customs House in New York. And it turned out that the, the sculptor who created this four statues at the entrance to the building that represent the four continents, you have Africa, um, Africa, Europe, America and Asia. And the first three statues were, were really told a continuation of the, of the whole story. Uh, Africa, you had, you had um, and they were all females. All the continents are named after women uh, because women give birth to civilization. They give birth to people. Uh, so all of the names of all of the continents are female names. And, and, and so Africa was, uh, and all of the continents were female figures sitting on a throne. The image of Africa was a sister, bare-chested, with long braid, asleep in the throne. And sleep is symbolic in, in sculpture. Uh, sleep is a metaphor for either unconsciousness or death. And she's sitting on, on a throne. One side of the throne was a lion's head. The other side of the throne was a sphinx head, hair of my cat. I was looking at it, wow, this is incredible. And then you walk on the side of that statue and you see this figure cloaked, holding something in his hand, a, a vase in his hand. And it's clear that he's a thief. <laughs> he's stolen something. Right? And, and obviously, if, if you interpret the, the, the metaphor that the sculpture uh, is, 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 has incorporated in it, um, whatever this person has stolen has resulted in the death of Africa. They've stolen the mind, the life force, the knowledge of Africa. And then, 
in Europe, the person on the throne representing Europe was um, Minerva, uh, the Roman version of the Greek goddess Athena, goddess of wisdom, goddess of war, goddess of knowledge and power. And Minerva is sitting on the throne, and she's holding a, uh, there's a globe in her hand, and on top of the globe is a book, an open book. And, um, and so an open book, so the globe represents the world, a book represents knowledge, uh, the, the uh, book on top of the, the globe representing using the knowledge to control the world. And on the side of that woman, opposite the side of the sister that represented Africa, was that same figure that was cloaked in Africa. He's now in Europe, and the cloak is off, and he's got the book in his hand. So, I mean, it's, it's crystal clear. And, and if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe that the same, uh, gosh, 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 I think the same sculptor who created that statue also was responsible for creating the heads of the Library of Congress. Right? Uh, so, so it's not surprising because, you know, this, you know, artists were usually moved from space to space to space in order to create their works. And what I, what I know, what I understand very clearly as an artist, is that artists, whether it's a, a sculptor, a painter, an architect, a, a dancer, a singer, a musician, artists are conduits for spirit. Right? Artists are inspired people. And all inspired means inspirited. Spirits move through you. You know, uh, the Greeks talked about the, the muse. You know, my muse, finding my muse, finding your spirit. Finding that person to give you the words to say or the eye to create the painting or the sculpture or whatever. So, you know, this, this whole idea of, of, of spirit moving among people is, is, is an old reality. It's an old reality. We are vessels to which uh, spirit moves. Uh, uh, spirit, good or bad spirits, are, are, are attracted to you based on your consciousness and they move through you, they express themselves through you. So an artist who is divinely inspired will create a work of art that is infused with his or her essence. And so the person who sees that work of art or who hears their music or watches them dance is similarly inspired by that spirit. So that's why, you know, for example, music is such a potent force. You know, Stevie Wonder, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire, you know, John Coltrane. These people are vessels through which the ancestors and spirits move through. And they fill a space with their energy. And those who are attuned to that energy can receive that energy, that spirit, and will become of a similar mind. And that's how spirits or the ancestors or, or the angels, whatever term you want to use to describe this unseen force that moves through everywhere and everybody and expresses itself. You know, our ancestors in Kemet understood this and were very connected to this, this power, this ability, which is the reason why they were able to create structures that he, they created structures 5,000 years ago that modern man with all of his technology cannot even replicate today. So what became crystal clear to me after, now I've been to Egypt 47 times, right? Mm -hmm. So after about my 13th or 14th trip to Egypt, when I stopped tripping about, you know, we're going to find this and we're going to find that, and realized you ain't going to find nothing, you know, <laughs> you know just, just accept the fact that everything that you're looking for is dead and gone, you know, and the Arabs own everything. You ain't never getting nothing back except that reality. And, and once, I, once I settled down, and I, I remember walking through um, I, I pet I sit, uh, the, the, the temple that the Arabs referred to as Karnak. You know, and I got to stop using the word Karnak because Karnak means the fortress. Really? The fortress. They thought it was a fortress because of this huge wall. No, it was I pet I said. It was the most selective places. It was where the spirit of our men, the unseen presence of the creator, resided in this sacred space. That's why it was the most select of places in a city known as Waset, the scepter, the crown.
crown, the jewel. And I remember standing in the Hyperstone Hall, Karnak Temple, and just seeing it for the first time. You know, you know, taking off the blindness and seeing it for the first time and daring to imagine what it looked like when it was brand new. What does this space look like when it was brand new, you know, 4,000 years ago, when every square inch was painted, when there was still a ceiling on top of, of the pillars, you know, and the priests and the priestesses were moving about. And as I allowed myself to, you know, to go back and envision that reality, you know, it suddenly dawned on me that these were people who knew how to live as human beings. And we are living as subhuman. We don't have the faintest idea. We are living as subhuman and think that we're all that. We don't have a clue. We don't know what it means to be human. And the word human, um, it, it, human is a Sanskrit word. Human means God, man means mind. So you're a God-minded being. In other words, you are a vessel through which the creator expresses itself. And if you understand that and uh, allow yourself to be open to that energy, then you then become a creator. And you create things to stand the test of time. This is what our ancestors in the Nile Valley knew. And they knew it before anybody else on the planet. They, they, they used this knowledge longer than anybody else on this planet which accounts for the reason why they were able to create things that everybody wanted, but nobody wanted to pay for, as Dr. John Henry Clark says. So now that we've lost this, and others have claimed it as their own, then they feel the need to disconnect us from that, because if we were to ever discover that this was once ours, then it means we can begin to find our way back home mentally, spiritually, which means that we can no longer be controlled by them. So the only way these people can exist and maintain control over us is to keep us mentally dead, to keep us worshiping gods who are not our own, to keep us drugged with, with alcohol or, or with, with, with heroin or, or crack cocaine or, 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 or religion. Or, 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 or fashion or materialism, all these things that separate you from your real self uh, keep you in a confused, debilitated state which allow others who are essentially newcomers to humanity to control you. And that's what it's all about. Real it's, hard to, it's hard to um, comprehend how juvenile delinquents can gain control over the most ancient human beings on the planet. We have devolved to the extent that that can happen, that has happened. You said we are our ancestors. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but, but we are our ancestors in a deluded state? Mm -hmm. uh, more, more or less, more or less. And, and, and if we are courageous enough to, to acknowledge the past, to acknowledge the fact that everybody makes mistakes, you know, Sankofa advises us to go back and reclaim the past, the good and the bad. You can learn from everything. And if we're honest enough, you know, we have to get beyond, we have to get beyond the childish notion that the ancient Africans, everybody was a king and queen. We did all these great things. Yeah, but we messed up too. We made some mistakes. We abused that power. And it was only by us abusing that power that we became vulnerable to outsiders primitives and savages. We messed up. We lost the keys to the house, which made it possible for others to come in and take everything away from us and then ultimately take us. Right? So we, we have fallen, but that doesn't mean we can't get back up. That doesn't mean that we can't reclaim that which we once had. So it's okay to study us. It's okay to, to look at, to acknowledge the fact that we messed up. Acknowledge it and then move forward. What do we do wrong? When do we do it? How do we do it? Now, I'm going to make a commitment to never do that again. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with making mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. And anybody who tells you that they don't make mistakes is lying to you. The key is to learn from your mistakes. The key is to get back up and to keep moving. There's nothing wrong with falling. There's something wrong 
if you fall and don't get back up. That's what makes you a better person, a better, a, a, a better man. Failing is good because you learn what not to do. If, you, if you're all about learning and progressing and moving forward. And anybody who, who doesn't fail is afraid to live. So it's all about putting things in, putting things in perspective. And if we, if we dare go back far enough, then what we will begin to understand is that this thing called life is, is cyclical. It's not just a circle, what goes around comes around, but it's also cyclical. It's also a spiral. Right? And I think on one very basic level, now our ancestors were aware of the fact that nothing lasts forever. And I feel very strongly that they knew uh, at some point in the future that things would go awry and we will begin to abuse the power. And as a consequence of abusing that power, then we will be subjected to um, confusion, which would open the door for enemies to come in and exploit us. And that would happen for a prescribed period of time. I, I believe they, they were aware of that. And so given that reality, if you know that a, a, a tragedy is coming, then what do you do? Let me, let me hide some of this stuff. Because this tragedy won't last forever, and there will come a time when our people or us, if we understand the fact that we are our ancestors and we will come back at some point in time, then let me hide some things. Let me put some things. Let me scatter some information you know, around the world so that when it's discovered a thousand years from now, five thousand years from now, then the discovery of that information will begin to awaken certain centers within our minds and help us begin to connect the dots. And I think that that's where we are right now. We're beginning to discover these jewels that were hidden all around. And, and, and I, if I dare say so, and I'm kind of stepping out on a limb, you know, maybe our ancestors knew that the enslavement of Africans were coming. And we were going to be scattered all over the world. Um, and, and, and that Africa was going to fall. So that those Africans who were taken across the ocean to Americas, um, to the Americas would be enslaved, but at some point we would be free, and at some point we would become the wealthiest and best educated Africans on the planet. And we would have access to knowledge and information that has been hidden here in America. That, that's one of the things that, that I see within our Egypt on the Potomac field trip. Egypt is in America. It's real clear to me that uh, at some point decisions were made to recreate the Nile River Valley in the Potomac River Valley. And our stuff is right there in the capital of the wealthiest, most powerful nation on the planet. We're right there. So when things begin to synchronize, we will begin to be come into an awareness and be able to identify our ancestral symbols and knowledge that's right in our own backyard and connect those dots and begin to make the journey to go back to the motherland with that knowledge so that we can begin to find what they hid for us. I have so many questions, I don't know where to start. One of them has to do with the relationship of Kemet to the rest of Africa. Okay, so we fell down all over Africa, not just in Egypt, but mm -hmm. we was falling down in every part. Of I, I think I think what we see is um, Kemet. Kemet represents, on one hand, a flowering of the African people, but there have been discoveries in southern Africa uh, of, of of great cultures and civilizations that may, in fact, be older than Kemet. May in fact be older than Kemet. That possibility exists. Um, and when Kemet was subjected to invasion from, from the east and from the north, then the Kemites fled Kemet in a series of migrations. So, you know, let, let's, get, let's get this notion out of our head that when Kemet fell, Europeans just came in and took over everything. Africans saw what was coming, they knew what was coming, and they left. You know, it's just like when there's a storm warning, when there's a tornado coming, a, hur a hurricane coming. You know, you pack up your car, you get your food, you get, and you split. You go someplace until you get the all clear. So Africans went south, they went west, and they brought essence of their, their knowledge, their science, their spirituality with them. And you see 
traces of that in Ghana, in Senegal, in Nigeria, in Mali. It's, it's been said that the Dogons are the descendants of those Africans who were part of that sixth and final migration from the Nile Valley. So that's what they wrote. That's what their ancestors wrote, that they came from the east, they came from the Nile Valley, and that the people who came, their ancestors who came, came with the knowledge of uh, Sepetit or Potolo and Sigitolo or Sirius A and Sirius B. That's how that knowledge got, and it makes sense. You, you, look, you look at people today, when people move today, they take their iPods with them. They take their laptops and they, their iPads with them. They take their favorite books, and they go travel across the country to, to share what they know with others or, or to, to learn new things. That's what people do. That's what people have always done. We're no different than we were 5,000 years. We're the same people with the same needs. The only thing that's changed is the date on the calendar. So if we begin to, to realize what our people were subjected to, that uh, the invasion of Africa by the, by the Arabs and then uh, the Europeans uh, led to, um, you know, what, what did uh, uh, Laila Africa said that slavery was a drive-by on Africa. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and Africa fell, but Africans were dispersed all throughout the diaspora. And what I'm seeing now uh, is that brothers and sisters, I'll use D.C. for an example, D.C., Philadelphia, New York, where you have the Akan tradition, where you have the Yoruba tradition. They know more about, about the Orisha in D.C. and Philadelphia and New York than many Nigerians. Uh, no. Why? Because Christians have come in and they're recolonizing the Africans. So Africans are now going back, African Americans are now going back to Africa to teach them their own ancestral knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is where we are at this specific point in time in history. And what we, what we know is Africans then and Africans now, or in this instance, African Americans now, have been the key. African Americans are in a position now to free all of Africa if we woke up and stopped acting stupid, if we woke up and stopped polluting ourselves and engaging in nonsense. We have the wherewithal, we've got the financial resources to change everything.